Hi everyone, and welcome to another restoration at Mr. Carlson's lab. Let's get started. Hi everyone, and welcome to part three of this General Electric Model CX-371 radio receiver restoration. If you're new to the series and you'd like to get up to speed, there is a part one and a part two. So just below the video is the video's description. Just below the video's description is a show more tab. If you click on the show more tab, it will expand the video's description and the links to part one and part two will be there for you to click on. Also, this video is recorded in 4K. So if you want to watch this in 4K, just click the gear icon below the video and select 4K. Now, my audio will sound a little bit hollow right now in this particular portion of the video just because I have the microphone uh, pointed at this thing right here because I'm going to display something. Now, in the previous episode, we went over the schematic and I explained the entire schematic here and we looked inside and I said exactly what I was going to do in here, but I've come across something very valid to display to you and uh, this may help you in your future troubleshooting and repair procedures. So I figured I, I better stop and turn the camera back on and, and try and display all of this. So at any rate, what's going on here is as I'm putting the new components into this thing, I, I test everything before I put it in. The new parts I test and the parts that I'm going to leave behind, of course, I'm testing as well. So I, I test the capacitors for multiple parameters and I also mark the outside foil end and put them in the correct way. And I test the resistors for resistance and noise and all that kind of stuff. And um, as I'm going through and, and testing the plate resistor on the first amplifier stage in this amplifier here, uh, I did find a very noisy resistor. Now, modern devices don't have this function. So uh, older test gear like this old Heathkit T3, this is a model T3. I did a restoration on this as well, if you'd like to see that. That's in my list of videos. So this old T3 has the ability to listen to noisy resistors. And how does it do that? Well, what it does is in the noise position, it applies B plus across the actual resistor and it listens to it at the same time. So it loads the resistor and listens to it. Very neat function, okay? So I've already replaced, or I have a, a replacement resistor in here so we can compare, all right? So what I'll do is I will zoom on into this here, pardon the camera movement. I'll zoom on into this so that we can see that resistor. And hopefully that is somewhat clear, it is. I'll just uh, move the focus here to the resistor, there it is. So this is the, the new resistor here that I'm going to install. It's a uh, same thing, carbon composition resistor. Same thing as this one, it's just much higher quality as uh, you can see by the bands here. I should, uh, my hand I think is blocking everything. So uh, this is the, the new one that's gonna be installed and this is the one that I've removed from circuit. Now this one attaches to the plate of the first amplifier stage. And of course, if this is noisy, what's it gonna do? Well, it's just gonna go through the entire, uh, you know, phase inverter circuit and power amplifier and it's, it's gonna be noisy, right? You're going to be listening to bacon sizzling in your uh, amplifier. So whenever you have a high value resistor like this, like 470k ohms on a plate, uh, you definitely want to check those because there is quite a bit of drop across this. Again, you know, the, the amplifying stage is uh, obviously a, a class A type of amplifier stage. And uh, there is, you know, quite a bit of drop across that. So whenever there's drop across a carbon composition for a long period of time, well, you have the chance of a noisy, noisy resistor. So at any rate, so what I'll do is I will turn you, actually I'll move you up to the, uh, the tracer here. So there it is. Okay, so right now I have this in tracer mode. So there is no B plus or anything on this cable. It's just in tracer mode. So it's just listening right now. But as soon as I click this to the noise position, what this does is this applies uh, B plus to this cable here through a resistor inside the device. And uh, it also listens to it at the same time. All right, so a very neat function. Again, if you're gonna use this function on an old device like this, it is putting B plus onto the cable. So if you're gonna use something like this, definitely look into it before you, you do this and be very, very careful because you don't wanna come across the, the clip leads or anything like that. It's because uh, you know, there's B plus there. So be very, very careful. So if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Learn about the device before you use it. All right, and of course, again, if you're gonna use this, uh, read the Heathkit manual, all right? So now, anyways, so it's on the tracer function, so what I'll do is I'll click this to noise, all right, so now it's putting B plus across that resistor and it's listening to it, and I'll turn this up, and we'll take a listen to the new resistor. Now, the hum that you hear and the little bit of residual noise is from the gain stage inside the actual uh, Heathkit T3, okay? 
So as you can hear, that resistor is very nice. It'll just sit here all day and just sound like that. And that is a lot of gain, all right? That's why you're hearing the hum. If I put my hand just close to the, the chassis, that's me touching the chassis. That's me just holding my hand close to it. And I'm tapping the chassis. So it's incredibly sensitive. So it's listening to a bunch of things around here. If the chassis were shielded, that would be a lot quieter, all right? But this is just a, an open chassis test. So now, before I do anything else, what I do is I turn the gain down first, and I turn this back to tracer so that it removes the B plus from the resistor, because I don't want to be handling those clip leads while that's in noise mode. And um, yeah, that's something to always do. It's kind of like uh, with your standard, uh, if you have a DMM or something like that, and you're measuring current, you know how you have to move the, the cables around to different sockets? Well, it's uh, very standard once you're done measuring current, you always, just by default, you plug, un undo the leads from the current jacks and you plug them back into the, the jacks that read voltage on your DMM. You never leave them in the current jacks because you'll forget, you'll shut your meter off, and the next time you pick up your meter, you just turn it on to voltage and you think you're looking at voltage, but really, you'll grab your meter leads and you'll touch them in a circuit, and because it's on current, you'll dead short the circuit, right? You feed it through the shunt in the meter. So it's the same kind of thing. You always just default to removing the the, uh, the Heath kit uh, signal tracer or whatever signal tracer you have, because a lot of them have the noise function. You always default to taking it off the noise position. Never leave it in the noise position. All right. So anyways, so now what I'll do is I'll move this to the noisy resistor. So the negative lead of the tracer, as you can see, is attached into circuit. It doesn't matter because this is just negative. So the Resistor under test always has to have one lead open, and that's the sense lead from the actual signal tracer. You can't leave that in circuit. So, noisy resistor right here. Okay, this one right here. So what I'll do is I'll move back up to the tracer here again. Okay, so here we go. So I'll click it on to noise, and listen to this one. Now, a lot of the times you can, if you really want to make that noise go crazy, uh, you can put a soldering iron just below the resistor and heat it a little bit, kind of help it out. And uh, they usually just go absolutely crazy when they're noisy. So it has its moments. Again, it's intermittent, right? Yeah. So that would be horrible to leave that resistor in circuit because you know what you would be doing next? You'd be going, oh, I have a noisy tube. And here's what gets tricky. And don't be fooled by this because this fools a lot of people. So what happens next is you shut the amplifier down. So now everything's cooling off again. And then you pull the, the tube out and change it. You put a new tube in, turn it back on, and it sounds quiet. And you think you found the problem. Well, in that time, the resistor under test has cooled down, and so has the surrounding circuitry, right? It's a small device, so it's cooled down, and maybe even the newer tube that you've put in isn't drawing the same amount of current. So it leads you astray, and you think you found the problem. You know, yes, I've changed the tube. Well, you put the whole thing back together, and 10 minutes later, it's doing the same thing. And you're like, ah, i got to pull the whole thing apart again. So it's very important to spend time with the resistor. So I'll just turn this Turn this down. So anyways, that was a pretty decent example. It acted up pretty good there. Sometimes it sits silent for a while. So there you have it. So let's zoom you back out here. And you can see the microphone here is pointed at that. So it's always very important to check the resistors as you go. And this was a very valid description. So I figure, okay, I'm going to stop and share all of this with all of you. If I come across anything else like this, as I'm uh, about you know going through things, if I, I find uh, something else that I figure I should show you, I'll, I'll stop on it. I'm just about to the point to where I can put power to the amplifier and give it a dynamic test. 
What I'd like to do though first is clean the potentiometers and clean this wafer switch here. So this switch is the power on and off switch and it selects between the phono input and the radio input. And as you can see here, you can see how those discs move between these little contacts here. And as you can see that disc is basically black, it's tarnished so bad. So what I'm going to do is take a little bit of Tarnex and I'm gonna put some Tarnex on here and I'm just gonna work this like this here and sometimes it takes a while. This can be a little bit of a tedious procedure. You can see what's coming off on that Q-tip, right? It also helps to leave a little bit on there as well. You have to be careful around the actual little contacts so that you don't hurt the contacts because they are pretty fragile. And as you can see, you can get the idea. What a difference, right? So if I can get a little bit better light on that, maybe. Another thing is I follow the directions on the Tarnix bottle. So the stuff doesn't really smell all that nice. So as I say, follow the safety precautions on the bottle. As you can see, I'm using gloves and everything. I don't want to get this stuff on my hands. So you can see, anyways, that's about the best lighting here that I can get. You can see how that's taken all of that basically black oxidization off of there. And uh, now when this is rotated, and you can see that it's gonna make better contact. Now, this is just an open area here that I'm showing you on and, show, and it shows you how well this stuff removes that oxidization. The part that I really need to be working on is right in the corner here. And then, of course, this little upper disc. So what I want to do is move these to areas where I can get that Q-tip and the Tarnex in there. So, of course, I'll be working at it from the top side here. And then I'll be working at it from the bottom side here. And anywhere where there's a little contact that makes contact to that disc, I want to make sure that's clean. And then as a final, what I'll do is I wash this out with some contact cleaner. So, and that should... Uh, should restore those contacts and uh, make it really, you know, function well for a lot of years. Let's just put it that way. After I'm done with that, uh, the potentiometers are up here. What I'll end up doing is spraying some contact cleaner in them, working them around, and then I'll re-lubricate them because the contact cleaner, a lot of the times, will remove the lubrication from where the shaft joins to the body. So if you take all the lubrication out of there, the controls usually feel pretty gritty um, or just, I don't know, they don't feel very good. So what you end up doing is uh, putting just a very light oil in there again and uh, moving the potentiometers around and uh, that restores their action as well and makes them feel nice and smooth the way they did when they rolled off the factory floor. It's a little hard to get the camera and the light in exactly the right position here to get into this little switch. I've got the zoom zoomed right in here. But as you can see, that's completely cleaned now. Uh, it used to look this color before. Now you can see it's nice and nice and clean in there. And that's really is necessary to do to restore the conductivity of the switch. If you don't do that, uh, you know, you'll get intermittent connections and it'll be kind of scratchy when you move it around and things like that. Now this is especially important in the RF oscillator and antenna section as well. It needs to be very good contact. Now, just spraying contact cleaner in there does a decent job as well. You'll notice that it will just put little scores on the disc where the fixed contact is actually pinching on the disc. It'll put little scores there, but it still leaves the rest of the of the moving contact oxidized, and then of course it reoxidizes again in those small spots really quickly. So it is worth the time to. Uh, to, you know to actually clean the entire disc off and that way you know that you're you're going to be dealing with a decent connection for quite a long time and once you're done of course you need to hose it down with contact cleaner or whatever and wash all of that other chemical off now as i say follow the instructions on the bottle and uh, make sure that you're not using two chemicals that are going to you know do something bad when they react and another thing that you really need to keep in mind is that if you're going to be using enough of it to actually drip on the the chassis uh that that particular uh, uh, Tarnex stuff doesn't really, I guess you could say, cooperate with cadmium. It'll discolor it a little bit. So uh, make sure that you're doing this in a well-ventilated area and use gloves and, and uh, definitely use eye protection. That, uh, that stuff is, um, 
is a, a pretty good cleaner. Let's put it that way. All right. It is a, it's a very good cleaner. So just be careful. If you think you're going to be dripping on anything, you know, put something under there to stop it from dripping. Because if, if you forget about it and leave it on a, you know, the drips on a cadmium coated chassis, it will, uh, you know, it will cause some issues. So just some stuff to keep in mind. They have a whole list on the bottle of uh, metals that you shouldn't put it on. So, um, yeah, just check that all out and uh, always test it in an inconspicuous area, things like that, right? The power supply and amplifier chassis are pretty much ready for a dynamic test at this point. So lots of components have been replaced and days and days have gone past and uh, some things have been moved around as well just to optimize things just because of the new components and I'll explain exactly what's been done. So if you're into building amplifiers or working on point-to-point -point circuitry or as I say rebuilding radios and restoring things like this, you may want to get a, a notepad or a pen and paper and take some notes if you're new to this because I'm going to share some tips and tricks with all of you that will help make your designs all that much better. So first of all, I'll talk about the components that have been left behind and really it's just resistors and not many of them either. So I thoroughly tested all of the resistors that were left behind for value and I look at them physically to make sure they're not cracked or chipped or anything like that. And of course I've listened to them as well as I displayed earlier in this video. So I make sure that they're quiet and everything on top of all of this. So the resistors that are left behind are these two 1K grid stoppers here. There's a 4.7K resistor here, a 22K resistor here. There's a 330K ohm resistor up here. Oh, I also left the 15 meg resistor behind. It was very close to 15 megs and very silent as well. Uh, this 3.3k ohm resistor here in the power supply is left behind. Uh, this 5.6k ohm resistor here and this 470k ohm resistor here are the extent to all the components that are left behind. Everything else under here resistor and capacitor wise has been replaced. So lots and lots of parts and I've also moved things around just because of size and to optimize on the design and I'll explain a little bit about that and this is very important if you build amplifiers you may want to take some notes regarding this. So the reason that the CAN capacitors here, the factory CAN capacitors, were mounted at this point of the chassis is just due to, you know, size constraint. The speaker magnet is right here, and these CANs would hit the speaker magnet if it was any further forward. As you look anywhere else on the, on the chassis, there's not a whole lot more room. So what they've done is they've put the two CAN capacitors between the transformer here and between the power tubes. The power tubes get very, very hot, this one here being very close to the CANs. And of course the transformer gets very, very warm. That's the reason that they've punched holes in the chassis all the way around the core and up around the rectifier tube as well because the rectifier tube gets very hot as well. You'll notice a row of holes here on each side of the 6V6, again for convection cooling. So as the hot air is rising, as the heat is rising, I should say, what it's going to do is it's going to pull, pull cool air from the bottom portion of the uh, of the radio and then through these holes and it's going to convection cool the transformer and these tubes that's the reason that they've done that now these two main filter capacitors are right between two heat sources and of course you know that's going to cause heating of these cans and that's probably one of the reasons that this is leaked out probably just because the can has been hot i've tested the cap and the capacitors are still all there the esr is a little high but uh you know they're it's still all there so I would never ever trust anything like this and that's the reason that they're out of circuit but chances are this is again has gotten hot and you can even see a little bit of color around the pin here I don't know if you can see that so anyways there's a bit of color around that pin as well so indicating that there may have been just a touch of leakage at some point all right so they may have tried to vent the new filter capacitors are now mounted along this side of the wall on this terminal tie strip there's five filter capacitors over here and you can see that they're all facing upwards. So the vent on all of these capacitors is facing up. So if one of these capacitors was to ever fail, it will vent towards a steel chassis. It will not vent downwards towards the wood. All right. There's a, a much reduced chance. There's always a chance that, you know, something could happen in the bottom portion of the cap and it would vent downwards, but they're designed to vent up. These capacitors here will always vent downwards, all right? So they're going to push their heat towards the, the wooden bottom here. 
So this is just another safety feature, which is having them vent upwards. Just more good design practice. So you always want to keep that uh, in mind. If you're ever designing uh, an amplifier, you'll see that a lot of um, amplifier designers like to build their amps in wooden chassis with no inner metal chassis. That is extremely dangerous. Every time or any time that you want to put together any type of a vacuum tube amplifier, anything with a power supply and heat generating components in it, you definitely want to be using a metal chassis. Never have just a wooden chassis and uh, components just, you know, screwed into a wooden chassis. Very, very bad design practice by doing that. And I've seen that a lot. And I see people advertising these things. And it's just, I look at that and I just shake my head, you know. Thing is an insurance claim rating to happen right so the capacitors now that they've been moved over here are moved onto this tie strip and they're very easily replaced they're much easier to easier to replace than they would be to you know to pull one of these cans out if you would replace the whole can and if you were to restuff these cans and put new caps in them to just hide them way easier to replace these they're under the chassis so they're away from the heat they're not between the power tubes and the transformer anymore even though that these are 105 degree rated caps they're wonderful capacitors and honestly i can tell you i don't think these capacitors will ever come out again I think these are in here for the long run. I spend a lot of time grading and verifying components, and I put the lists up on Patreon. Uh, I can't tell you how, how much time I spend in grading these components, and these are some of the parts that are on that list. These caps, as I say, will probably be in here till the end of this radio, all right? I've, I have very good faith in these. So now, in order to replace any of these things, just say you wanted to replace them, all you have to do is just desolder these connections here on the chassis and remove these two screws and this whole terminal tie strip just lays over you heat the tab up and pull the cap out and put a new one in and that's how easy it is for hum consideration i'm also moving the filtering over to the far corner of the chassis which is just good design practice you want the the power supply section as far away from the first amplifier as absolutely possible in any type of amplifier design you can see the engineers already know this they have the power supply transformer in this corner and they have the pre-amplifier tube in the extreme far corner of the amplifier chassis it's not over here or over here or anything like that because you don't want the magnetic field of the transformer coupling into the tube and the tube to listen to the transformer and of course you would just have that in your audio all the time you'd have a buzz or hum in there all right so you want the preamplifier as far away from the power transformer and i also want as i'm you know designing this power supply i want to keep the filtering and everything and the current flowing in that section in this corner so you'll remember that the center tap for the B plus winding was down here on this tab that's been removed because under this this could oxidize and there isn't a soldered connection here the two first filter capacitors in the power supply all right the two business end of things here so there's actually three because they they put two in parallel here but there's uh technically this is two capacitors all right the first two caps are this capacitor and this capacitor here the center tap the ground for the uh, the high voltage or the uh, the B plus winding is right in the middle of these two right here. Okay, so the the shield inside the transformer here is also running up to this point, and this is the ground, so right between the two caps. So you can see that I'm trying to focus the the filtering and the current flow in that section into this area. So I want to keep the DC all over to this side, and I want to keep anything with ripple onto this side as far away from the preamplifier as possible. It's very important. Okay, so that's a lot of the times why you see a lot of the really high-end preamplifiers. They won't even have a power supply in them. The power supply is completely remote, and they have an umbilical cable from the power supply up to the preamplifier. That's just to keep any stray magnetic field from the transformer, even minor stray magnetic fields from shielded transformers. Just keep it all the way from the preamp. That's how you create a perfectly silent preamp as silent as you can at any rate let's put it that way i don't think anything is perfectly silent but uh, as silent as you can build it all right let's just say that another good design practice for hum reduction is if you're going to have capacitors mounted away from the rectifier and say the ground is away 
from the rectifier. So say, you know, the, the ground from the transformer mounted here, you could, you could have a first filter can right here or something like that, you know, if the ground was here and here. And of course, you know, you would have the, uh, you know, you wouldn't have any remote wiring at that point. You wouldn't want to put a filter here because our audio input is here and I want to keep the current flow away from this area. Okay. That's why nothing is put here. So all the capacitors have been mounted across here and you'll see that the the current draw runs from the capacitor okay so the first filter here runs at from the rectifier directly over to this capacitor and then you'll see a wire running from that over and it runs down here that red wire runs over here to the to the tap on the uh, audio output transformer so the rectifier goes to the can and then from the filter you run the lead to the uh, to the actual point that's drawing current let's put th put it that way that's another good hum reduction technique so another example is you'll see these orange wires here running from the 6v6 to the 6v6 so these are the screen grids you'll see the orange wire running up over to here to the filter can all right and then from the filter can it runs back to the power supply it's on the other end of this 330 ohm resistor okay that's this 330 ohm resistor right here right and you can see the screen tap is right here running up to the screens and then the the plate tap for the center tap on the transformer here all right so the uh, the plates of the 6v6s is, is running right from this point right here on each side of the center tap so that's on each side of this tap right here all right so that's the ground for the DC supply all right so we're keeping the filtering as close to that as possible. So you, you kind of see what's happening here. We're keeping all of the, any kind of the ripple as far away from the DC circuitry as possible. And uh, that's the best thing you can do when you're stuck with having a power supply on, or the transformer on the same chassis as a preamplifier, okay? This capacitor here, again, is just the uh, uh, the uh, cathode capacitor on the, uh, on the 6v6, so no big deal. It can just ground to this point over here. So there's some very, very good hum reduction techniques for you right there. Always keep that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is the, the coax cable is shielded. You can see it's running by the transformer here, and we have, you know, you know uh, the, the B-plus leads here to the plates of the rectifier tube. You can see they're actually touching it. So we have a shielded cable that runs up to this point up here. Now you'll notice that the shield is only grounded in one spot. It's not grounded at both ends to omit any type of a loop happening and any current flowing through the coax again which would create hum so we only have one end of the coax grounded so the braid at this end is just capped off and only the center conductor which is the signal the signal lead is running through here and up to this point and you'll notice that with this again this is done from the factory because the engineers know this so you'll see that at this point here the coax is grounded only at one end and then the shield is left open at this end so that you don't get current flow through this creating hum. And then, of course, the, the, uh, the signal lead runs up through this and over to here to keep things shielded. Now, that's very important to keep in mind. If you ground both ends of the coax, you inadvertently may add hum to your circuit. So that's another thing to put into your, uh, into your book of, uh, of hum reduction techniques. The ground here is also lifted up and running close to the capacitor. Not that that's going to really do too much because there really isn't a whole lot of AC circuitry in this area. It's lifted far away from the filament leads. This is the main filament leads. And this is the point of high current draw because this is where everything starts. So you want to keep this as far away from these uh, filament leads as possible. Uh, this is the main filament lead that runs out and then it runs to the radio chassis from this point. And then, of course, it feeds the amplifier chassis here. You'll also notice that if you're designing a vacuum tube amplifier and the filaments are AC, you're also wanting to put all the, the high current drawing tubes and all the high current drawing circuits closest to the filament leads and you want to work away from that to the highest gain stage. Okay, so you'll notice that these two 6v6s are going to pull a whole lot more filament current than this tube is going to. So we want this tube far away so these are going to be drawing this as you can see these run down here to to this point first all right to the to the filament circuit and they have the ground here all right and then it runs from there over to here and then over to here last in circuit you wouldn't want to run 
anything like this to a preamplifier first and then run this to all the current drying tubes because you don't want to be pulling a maximum amount of current and having lots of current on the filament leads very close to the preamplifier tube. You want to keep the current on the, the AC current on the leads close to this circuit as low as possible. Okay, another thing to write down and keep in your book that's very important for amplifier design. Nowadays, you can build DC circuits and run the, the tubes on DC. And there's still a lot of trickery in that too because you can get rectifier buzz happening in the tubes and all sorts of things if those circuits aren't built properly as well. So uh, I'll go uh, talking about direct current um, you know, circuitry for vacuum tubes here in the future. So these are all things that you really need to keep in mind when uh, you're putting something like this together or if you're designing something from scratch. So I hope those tips help you out. At this point, we're ready to uh, give this thing a dynamic test. Let's see what happens. So do you think it's going to come alive? Well, I guess let's find out. We're not going to attach the radio, obviously, so we'll just run this. So the B-plus will be slightly elevated because uh, there is no current draw from the radio chassis, but yeah, it should be fine. All right, do you think it's going to come to life? Well, let's find out. So I'm all ready to go. I've got the voltmeter on the highest range, which this will read up to a kilovolt on that range. I have the leads plugged in. I've got the ground of the meter attached to the chassis, and I have my probe ready to go so I can check the B-plus in this chassis. This is attached to the isolation transformer and current limited variac supply, which we're going to take a look at right now, and I'll explain how that's going to work. So... Pardon all the movement of the camera and everything. Okay, I think that should be good. And I'll zoom on in just to this just a little bit. I'll move the focus around so you can see that. So what's happening now is this is plugged in to the isolation transformer and current limited variac supply, but the amp is off. Okay, so what is going to happen is since the variac is up, and the bulbs will look at the load of this itself. When I first turn this on, the bulbs will glow just a little bit. That tells me that everything's happening and I've got current at the outlet right here. So I'll do that right now. So keep in mind the amp is off. So that little bit of glow that you see is normal. Now that's not very bright here. It looks a little brighter in the camera than it actually is. So that's bright. That isn't. So you can kind of compare the two. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the amplifier on. So what should happen is the bulb should get bright for a moment and then come down or brighter and then come down and then maybe brighten up just a little bit as the tubes start to pull, you know, as they come into emission, as they start to conduct. So you'll see them come up a little bit brighter. Now, if I first turn the amp on and those go crazy bright, that means that I have a shorted transformer or a short somewhere. If I turn it on and, as I say, it gets bright, comes down, and then gets crazy bright, that would mean that I have a short directly after the rectifier. Okay, so I'm going to be watching this. So right now, if everything's normal, it should just get a little bit brighter and then dim down a little bit. So let's, let's find out if we're going to experience this. So here we go. Amplifier is about to be switched on. And that's looking pretty normal to me at this point. So, yeah, not too bad. Very noisy car out there. I don't know if you can hear that car just droning away. And it's pretty much just staying like that. Okay, so that's not bad. That is not alarming, which is good. Okay, so what I'll do here is I'll move you back over to the amplifier. And I'm going to start to check out some voltages. So I'll move the focus there. Hopefully that looks all right. So now what I want to do is I want to check the, the B plus here first. So that's what I'm going to do. So let's see what's happening. Now this, keep in mind, this is through the dim bulbs. 291, not bad. 291.8. Not bad at all. Okay, so let's check the screens. So this would be the screens right here. Let's see if the screens are, they should be very close. Yeah, 291. Let's check the plate of the phase inverter right here. Not bad. And let's check the plate of the first amplifier. So there should be quite a bit of drop. That one is right here. Should be quite a bit of drop there because of the high value plate resistor. 109, there we go. So far, so good. So we've got screen voltage and B plus and everything here. So what I'll do is I will bypass now 
I'll put this here so we can watch the voltage up here. So I'm going to bypass the uh, the dim bulbs. So what do you think this is going to go up to? So right now it's current limited through those bulbs, so we're dealing with quite a bit of drop. Here we go. Whoa, that goes way up there, right? 407. Now as the tubes are heating up and they're coming into heavier emission, that's the reason you're seeing it drop down, because now the tubes are starting to draw a lot more current. All right, so what I'll do here is um, I'll move this out of the way and put this down here like so. Lots of noisy vehicles here today, wow. So over here, and let's take a look at the top. The tubes are glowing normally. I cleaned the chassis too, by the way. And there was a, there's no rocket science to that. That was just uh, basically uh, uh, like a scotch right pad and some water. That's all it is, and it uh, came up very, very nice. So it's just, just you know, surface dirt. So everything's looking good. I'll uh, move some of the lamps so you can see the glow of the tubes. So you can see the rectifier is glowing real nice. Move that down to the rectifier. So the filaments in that are glowing really nice. No problems there. And let's take a look at this, the little 12AX7. You can see the filaments glowing in there. Get just a little bit closer. There it is. Looks good. And let's check out the 6V6s. So that one's glowing real nice. And this one here. So no problems. Move the focus down just a touch. So no problems at all. So the next thing to do is... Oh, did you see that? I saw a flash in there and I heard a tick. Well, that's interesting. What are the chances of that? Look, like there's a little flash in here and I heard a tick. Let's just watch that for a moment and see if it happens again. Unless, of course, I'm seeing things. I saw a flash in the monitor. Hmm. Well, that's not very hot. That should be blazing hot right now. That is hot. This is not hot. This is filament hot. So keep in mind, when I was tapping this, this is how I, I was very quickly tapping it, and it didn't feel very hot, and that's the reason I did this. If you ever come across a power tube like this, do not put your fingers on it like that, because uh, you'll learn the hard way. So I was doing this, and it's like, that's kind of warm that's i did this so yeah it's just filament hot that one is hot that's crazy hot so that's telling me that we probably don't have plate well see do you see that it's sparked in there so since it's not hot and it's sparking we have screen grid voltage that makes me wonder i don't think we have plate voltage on this which means that we might have a bad audio transformer i hope not wouldn't that be nice if it was just a bad connection in the socket or something? Well, let's find out. Yeah, that's just, that's comfortably warm. If you had cold hands, that would be uh, re really quite comfortable. If I was to do this with that tube there, I would have very bad burns. I could probably melt plastic on that tube. That's how hot the power tubes normally get. So. All right, so let's check out the, uh, let's see what's going on here. Well, that's not good. I was thinking we were ready to go. All right, I'll move the focus back up to the meter here, and let's check out some voltages. All right, that is not a good thing. All right, so the tube that's hot, so this would be the plate lead here. We got 356, 355, so let's check out the plate of the tube that's flashing. Minus 31.4 volts. Well, looks like I have a bit more work ahead of me. That audio transformer has an open winding in it. And that's the reason it's sparking right now. It's because there's no plate. 
So we just have screen voltage, right? You'll see the screen here, 360, but no plate. Wonderful. Okay, audio transformer removed. So just six leads and a couple of screws on the bottom side of the chassis and it just comes right off. So it almost looks like they designed it for a quick replacement. So it just sits on the chassis and the screws come up through the bottom, just remove this like so. Came off surprisingly easy. So I figure since we've gone this far with this amplifier here, why not make it a bit better? Factory transformer here and replacement transformer. So quite a bit larger, more core material, better lows, and should sound very, very good. So these this will sit a little closer to the tubes, but I think there's still enough breathing space. It has the uh, convection cooling holes there. I'll put it upside down so we can get an idea. So you can see that. Might be about there. I can still get my hand in here. No problems. So I think it should be okay. I can wrap my hand around it. And the convection cooling holes are still here. So, eh, transformer's a little closer, but I think it'll be just fine. So that's what I'll do. I'll mount this very nice transformer on the chassis, and that should, uh, that should really make this thing sound good. The output transformer is now installed, and it worked out very well. It is a long ways away from the tubes. Reason being is I could actually push it a little further back on the chassis, so that worked out great. So it's about the factory distance or close to away from the actual tubes. Now that uh, the tube has been arcing inside, I really don't want to take a chance with those 6v6s. So I went and looked through my stuff and I found a whole bunch of 6v6s here. So I think what I'll do is I will put in some Jan 6v6s, brand new one. So I'll put that one in there. And uh, let's grab this one here, see how well this one looks like it uh, hasn't been opened. So, at least get something that, you know, visually matches. Uh, well, it's not far off, I guess. The side's a little different looking. Not bad. There it is. So, I think, yeah, well, the bases are a different color. Maybe I've got one that's a little bit closer. Let's see. I'm just getting picky now, right? So, uh, I think that one is closer. And the dates are close too. Uh, this one here actually has some of the writing. That looks like it's been a bit smeared off. There we go. Boy, those are nice and tight in the socket. There, now that looks good. The matching bases and everything. Now, you know what? Since I've got all this stuff here, why? Let's see, what is the date code on this? I'll have to sort that out later. So let's see. Uh, why don't we put in a brand new rectifier too? Let's just make this thing really good. So J-A-N, the tubes here mean Joint Army and Navy, so these are very, very good tubes. That would be the wrong end to open. So let's see here if I can open this one. There we go. Brand spanking new. So let's give it a brand new rectifier as well. All right, I'll move some things around here and uh, we'll turn the thing on and see if it makes any output power. When you put in your brand new audio transformer, if you have negative feedback in your amplifier, it's very important to make sure that the plate leads go to the correct output tube. So if you have the plate leads reversed, you'll make a very high powered oscillator out of your amplifier. And sometimes, depending on you know, how the feedback is set up, sometimes they can oscillate outside of our hearing range and you don't even know it, but you're damaging your speakers. And uh, if you have any animals, they definitely won't like you. So it's very important to make sure that you have the plate leads attached correctly. If you have them in reverse, you'll get motor boating and it's uh, very easy to test. All you have to do is put an oscilloscope across the output terminals and you know turn the your current limited power supply on. So I have this going through the dim bulbs and uh, I'm running this at reduced plate voltage just to give you a quick example of what happens when the blue and the brown leads are attached to the wrong tube. So I'll turn that on right now. And keep in mind that this is 20 volts per division on the scope. I'll move the focus over to the scope. So I'll just let it go into oscillation here for just a moment. It won't hurt anything to do the demonstration. And yes, there is no load across the output transformer. So there you go. 20 volts per division. That 
is a pretty big signal right there. So we'll shut that off. And that's what happens. So you would get this oscillation at a low frequency. You know, in this case, it would be a low frequency at the speaker and, you know, the speaker motor boats. You get that motor boating noise. So that's what it's, that's what it's called. Whenever you hear an amplifier is motor boating, that's what it means. It's oscillating. And in this case, it would be a very low frequency oscillation. So definitely make sure that you have your, your plate leads correct in the amplifier or you'll deal with this and if you have you know full power applied and it's a really high powered amplifier uh, you might damage the audio transformer or your speakers or something like that so in this case the blue lead has to be on this tube and the brown lead has to be on this tube here so i'll get that all hooked up and let's see how much power this thing makes with these new tubes so how many watts do you think the amplifier is going to make into eight ohms well let's find out so the amplifier has a 400 cycle or close to signal being fed into the input. The output is terminated across an 8 ohm load. This meter here is across the 8 ohm load and so is the scope. The scope is across the 8 ohm load as well. So this will directly read out in watts, which is kind of nice. It does the math. And as I turn the volume control up on this, we can watch the sine wave. And as soon as that sine wave starts to clip, that's where we stop turning it up. And that's our maximum clean power. And then of course, we'll just turn it right up to the max anyways and see what it makes into full distortion for the fun of it. So here we go. I'm going to turn up the volume. How many watts do you think it's going to make? So right now we're at one watt, nice clean sine wave there. Three watts. Four, five, six. Oh, and it's starting to clip now. You can see the top is starting to clip. So I'll back that down. And I'd say six watts. It makes about six watts clean. Not bad, not bad at all. So what I'll do now is I'll turn this right up into full distortion. That's cranked right up. Look at that, 13.3 watts. And that's right at the end of the volume control. I bet you if I give it just a bit more drive from the... Uh, a signal generator let's see if that'll do it yeah about 13.5 watts and a full distortion so not bad now of course this making six watts with you know minimal distortion is absolutely fine i can't even imagine how loud that would be with that speaker with this thing at six watts that would just be incredibly loud so now with this new transformer and this amplifier being able really to dive into the bottom end you know it'll have really good low frequency reproduction this should sound fantastic if i wanted to make more wattage out of this it would be very easy i just have to put two you know diodes like one in 5408s or something across this rectifier on the bottom and that would hold the power supply up vacuum tube rectifiers are really soft so there's a lot of drop in this little rectifier here now keep in mind it makes six watts right now but as soon as we plug in that radio chassis it's going to be drawing current off of this as well so the b plus is going to drop a little bit more because of the soft rectifier so we'll probably have comfortably 5.5 watts maybe 5 watts out of this still over enough and uh, you know nice push pull power here so it should sound really really good so i'm really happy with the outcome now the exciting part on to part four so in part four, we're going to take the radio chassis out of the cabinet and we'll take a look at that. I'm really looking forward to that. That should be a lot of fun. If you're enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronic devices alike. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. If you'd like to be notified as soon as I post a new video, don't forget to tap the bell symbol. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way and gaining access to many of my personal electronic inventions and designs, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the show more tab below the video's description and I'll also pin the link at the top of the comment section. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.